as you can tell, it's another, it's another, if you've been here for the series in James, another one of James's not so gentle um, instructions. So um, let me pray just very briefly one more time before we dive into James 3. Father, we have sung um, and asked you to speak. And now we just reiterate that and ask that we would listen as we've heard and as we hear what your word has to say. In Jesus' name, amen. I have a very strange memory from my grade one year. Um, long time ago, last century, I was in grade one, and I was in Mefro Sneeman's class in La School Brynston in Joburg. And I actually remember quite a, I don't remember what I had for, for breakfast most days, but I remember a few things about grade one. I can remember that really awkward first day, I'm sure we all had it, mum and dad on either side walking into Mefro Sneeman's class, and her, my folks seating me next to a boy called Franco Meiberg. And then afterwards, this really shy kid named Gerrit Lamprecht came to sit on my other side. And we were buddies throughout grade one. I can remember um, some naughty things that happened, and um, things that got us in trouble. I can remember birthday parties. And I can remember Mrs. Sneeman, I'll say Mrs. Sneeman from now, it just rolls a bit easier these days. Uh, Mrs. Sneeman telling us a story. And it was a story about a little girl who'd been in her class a few years earlier, uh, maybe back in the 19th century. And um, this kid, because Mrs. Sneeman was old. You know when you're seven years old, like, your teacher is just ancient. And she, but she was, she was old. I'm going to stop. <laughs> Especially seeing as we're doing a, this is the telling of a story. We're doing a passage on the tongue. I must stick to my notes. Um, Mrs. Sneeman told us a story about a little girl who was this angel in class. She was one of her favorite students. And she used to help her, you know, just brilliant. But then one day, she went to visit the home of this little girl. And she told us that as she walked up the pathway to the front door, you know, long before um, walls and intercom gates, she heard a commotion from inside, and she could hear this little angelic girl from her class shouting and screaming, saying all these horrible things to her mum. And Mrs. Sneeman told us that this really hurt her heart, and she turned around and went back home. She just didn't go to the meeting. Looking back at it now, I'm like, you manipulative Mrs. Sneeman, that's quite a story to tell us. But actually, I thought about it because it bears a little bit of resemblance to what James has to say in chapter 3. Because James says that, that the real you, the real me, comes out in how we speak. And how we speak when our um, hearts are given full reign. You know, at school or at work, we can kind of plaster over things, but at home that little girl gave full reign to what was just going on in her heart, and out came the things Mrs. Sneeman heard. The real you comes out in how you speak. And in chapter 2, we finished off last week, we were told that if you claim to follow Jesus, but there's no evidence in your life of this claim, your claim is false. Faith without the works that flow from faith is dead. There is no life to it. And afterwards, after the service, someone came to ask me what works James is talking about. You know, does this mean that all of us have to go and, and do these massive things for God? Do all of us have to start an Etemba project or open a, a, an orphanage or something like that? Maybe some of us do. Maybe some of us need to hear that word. That, yes, we do need to do these things. But the thing that everyone can do, the litmus test of the truthfulness of your claim that you trust and follow Jesus is seen in something that every single one of us can examine for ourselves. It's our words. Because even the quietest introvert in this hall, and I know there are a few, talk. James has referred to our speech a number of times already, that we're to be slow to speak, quick to listen, he said uh, something quite similar to last week, that if anyone thinks they are religious without controlling their tongue, their religion is useless and they deceive themselves. So if last week's challenge gave you a desire to examine your claim to faith by what you do, James says, begin with how you speak. Begin with how you use your words. And the folks he tackles first are those who want to be teachers or leaders in churches. So you can imagine that chapter 3, verse 1, 
is one of the scariest verses for someone in my position. But as well as being scary, it is a link verse. It connects what has come to what is to come. So not many should be teachers because their lives do not reflect their claim to faith. There are not the works that should accompany a living faith. And often, that lack of works is immediately visible by how they use their tongue. So not many should become teachers then, because their tongue, their words, have a greater potential to damage God's church. And for that, they restrict the judgment. God loves His church. And so I guess for CCC, for other churches, the immediate sort of application is before we appoint or approve any teachers, we are to examine the, their claim to faith by how they live. And a big part of that is looking at the things they say and the way they say them. So at Christchurch Cascades, we've had the policy that we are slow in opening up teaching roles for people as they join CCC. And this is not because we want to hold anyone back. It's just we want to make sure we're not rushing people before they're ready into teaching roles. And it's not that we think you're not a Christian. It's just that, as verse 2 suggests, there is a maturing process that has to happen in each of us. And we need to be certain that there is maturity when it comes to teaching. And it's why we ask Glenn today to pray for our elders, to pray for the folks who teach in groups, to teach our kids, to pray for parents who are teaching the faith to their kids. For, as James says, we do stumble in many ways. Not many of us don't stumble in what we say. Now remember, he's not speaking about perfection in verse 2. He's speaking about a maturing, a growth. Verse 8 says, no one can tame the tongue. So you are never going to get a perfect teacher. But you want to be the kind of person, whether you teach now or whether you want to teach or whether you will teach, you want to be the kind of person who works at controlling your tongue. And I think this is where the passage then begins to expand to saying all of us as God's people want to be those who control our tongues. And we'll get to how we do that a little bit later as we examine the last few verses. But first, we need to see why some introspection that's kind of the key word for us today. Some introspection for us uh, into our speech is crucial for us. And James does that through some really powerful imagery. And he shows us about four things about the tongue. Um, firstly, your tongue is small but powerful. So pull up verses 3 to 5 for us. I think they're on the screen next. He, um, he uses two illustrations to point us to how little things can make a really massive difference. So a bit is a small piece of metal that steers a horse. I wanted to say control a horse, but if you've ever ridden a horse, I have a few times. You can't control that thing. I, maybe some of you more experts people can, but I found that they were, they were worse than cats. Um, a rudder is a small percentage of a ship that controls an entire ship, and if you think about the largest aircraft carrier or battleship out there, those things are massive. And this rudder can steer it and take it where it needs to go. Small things, powerful things. The third most poisonous creature in the whole of the world is this one. Coming next, I hope. It is the blue... Um, is it not on there? Oh, bummer. I thought I'd put it on there. It's a blue-ringed octopus. There you go. It is the size of a golf ball, and one bite can kill 26 men. Dynamite comes in small packages. The African proverb, you must have heard it, if you think you're too small to make a difference, you haven't spent a night with a mosquito. <laughs> small does not mean powerless. The tongue makes up a small amount of our body, but it is powerful. You can cut down someone with it as quick as you can with a sword, and you can see the results. I actually remember seeing one of our kids saying something really, really hurtful to the other one. And you could see the reaction. It was a physical reaction, as if he'd been gut-punched. The tongue is small and powerful. And that's the second thing, this gut-punching, is it's small and powerful, and it's so often destructive. 
So look at the second half of verses 5 and 6. I hope I haven't confused you guys up there. I'm sure you can do. There you go. Uh, Consider how a small fire sets ablaze a large forest, and the tongue is a fire. Um, I was in the northwest province last month for a family wedding. I've got family who farm up there. And for about the month before that, they had been fighting felt fires on and off. You may have seen that in the news, the whole of the Northern Cape and the Northwest. So they were out probably six nights a week for a month fighting fires. And they said one of them was a felt fire that burnt down hundreds of thousands of hectares of farmland. And it started, uh, it was started by a spark from a welding iron. A spark from a welding iron caused damage that has impacted thousands and thousands of people's livelihood. Just a spark. If you look at verse 6 there, how far the destruction of the tongue can go within it. Within it is a world of unrighteousness. You can say things that cut people, that damage reputation, that hurt, that speak untruths, that turn people against each other, that shape people's opinions of other people unfairly. One wrong sentence said to one person can, and these days with WhatsApp and other social media often does, turn into a drama that involves dozens of people and needs time and effort to firefight it. The tongue can shape or stain your whole body. It shapes how people see you, how they listen to you, what they think of you, who likes hanging out with someone who is critical and nasty of others all the time. It's unpleasant. No one. Your words can set the course of your life on fire. Um, I read an article, I think it was earlier this year, it was about people who had, um, I'm so grateful Isaac mentioned the social media stuff, people who had, with one tweet, ruined their lives. And I remember one of those tweets because I was at Bible college when it was a lady from the States. She made a cruel, mean, hurtful statement about Africa and Africans as she got onto a plane from New York to Cape Town. By the time she'd arrived in Cape Town, that thing had exploded all over the, the, the net and she had lost her job. She had lost her friends She had just totally destroyed her life. And in this article, she wrote of how she has spent thousands of dollars on therapy, on help. She can't get work because, as Isaac says, it's there forever. And I was thinking how grateful I am that in the 20th century, when I was young, we had no social media. Because, like you, probably, I said stupid things. And I said them publicly, and I'm grateful that they're not there. Young people, much of your communication is done on social media, whether it's WhatsApp or some of the newer stuff that I'm not even aware of existing. It stays there forever. You have to be careful what you say and how you say it. The tongue is small, it's destructive, and it's uncontrollable. So look at verses 7 to 8. Every kind of animal, bird, reptile, fish is tamed and has been tamed by humankind, but no one can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil full of deadly poison. So James is making the point here that as much as we like to think that as humans we're able to tame the world and we're masters of everything, we haven't mastered our tongues. You know that of yours just this week. I know that of mine just this week. It's small, it's powerful, it's destructive, it's uncontrollable. And it points us to the war that wages within us. The double-mindedness within us. So have a look at verses 9 to 10. With the tongue we bless our Lord and Father, and with it we curse people who are made in His image. Blessing and cursing come out of the same mouth. My brothers and sisters, these things should not be this way. Your tongue points to your double-mindedness, because one moment... You can sing the praises of God. You are holy. And we were louder, I think, the guys from where I stood. Greg got his earpiece in it. It just didn't work. We can do that, and we can do it sincerely, truly believing that God is holy and wonderful, and we praise Him. And not 50 minutes from now, we're going to be standing there going, yeah, that person, such a jerk. And we're going to be bad-mouthing people made in the Lord's image. And that's just what happens, isn't it? 
And James says, yeah, it happens, but it shouldn't. Things should not be this way. If you're someone who professes faith in Christ, you cannot be satisfied with this kind of double-mindedness. You cannot be satisfied with this kind of double-mindedness. Brothers and sisters, this kind of goes back to what we said a few weeks ago. We think the sin of speech is not as serious as all the other sins. And so not only are we satisfied with this kind of double-mindedness, we don't even think about it. We don't even think it's important sometimes. I was listening to myself yesterday and thinking, that actually wasn't kind. That, that wasn't right. I should have said that better. That was a nasty comment. And I need to think about that more often. We don't even notice this. And that is what calls for introspection. It's what calls for each of us. And maybe today's the day that you need to do that. Examine what your words say about your heart. Because that's the last point James makes about the tongue. It points you to the state of your heart. What he says in verses 11 and 12, when he talks about different trees can't bring forth different fruit, and salt water springs don't give you fresh water, or vice versa. And it reiterates what his brother Jesus said in Matthew 12, that our mouths speak out of the overflow of our hearts. I think that's such a key thing to know because we, we often blame the situation or the other person for what we say. It's, and it's not the situation that causes us to speak angry or cutting or snide or rude words. Situations bring out what is already there. Who's on cleanup today? <laughs> I was, I'm, I won't do it, especially if I'm on cleanup. But what's inside this bottle? Coke. So if you think about the situations in life, so it's a hot day. I'm getting a bit testy. Uh, my wife and I argue about what was, who was meant to get lunch. I think it's been a bit, and then, you know, the electricity isn't working. And now this is all shaking up. What's going to come out of the bottle? Coke, right? You, don't have to be, sorry, you guys are all so smart. You're like, maybe he's trying to ask me. Coke's going to come out of the bottle. What's going to come out of my mouth after all these situations that have shaken me up? What is inside me already? I really was thirsty. I was going to drink some of that before, but we'll leave it for now. What comes out when you open the top is what, already, what is already inside. And if this is the case, as God suggests here, then the first 12 verses of chapter 3 aren't there for us to learn techniques for um, watching our speech. It's actually there to show us that our tongue is the primary indicator of our, the state of our heart. It's the barometer for your faith. It's the first thing that you want to look at when you think, do I have works in line with the faith that I claim to have? Look at your tongue. So what do we do? Well, if you're a Christian here this afternoon, I hope you echo what James says. This shouldn't be this way. Where do you go? Who among you is wise and understanding? Who would receive wisdom? the wisdom to understand how to deal with this, the one who asks God for it. Do you see this instability or this double-mindedness in your words? It's a heart change that is needed, and for that you need wisdom for God. Step one, ask for it. As one writer I was reading this week said, you want your tongue to be set alight, not from below by hell, but from above by God himself. So have a look at the second part of our text, where James says from verse 13, who, is wise, who among you is wise and understanding? By his good conduct he should show that his works are done in the gentleness that comes from wisdom. But if you have bitter envy and selfish ambition in your heart, don't boast and deny the truth. Such wisdom does not come down from above, but is earthly, unspiritual, demonic. And then carrying on, for where there is envy and selfish ambition... There is disorder in every evil practice. But the wisdom from above is first pure, then peace-loving, gentle, compliant, full of mercy and good fruits, unwavering, without pretense. 
and the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace by those who cultivate peace. I think again, verse 13 is aimed like verse 1 at those who would be teachers, but then broadens out. It says to us, wisdom is seen in character, not in cleverness. So there is a gentleness to what the person does. There is gentleness in how they speak to others. There is gentleness in how they treat those who disagree with them or how they convey the truth. It goes back to what we've been saying all along, that it's not just what you say, it is how you say it. So if we are looking for teachers and leaders in a church, if you are, as, um, as Greg said earlier, if you're kind of circling, how did you say, circling the basin or the drain? <laughs> <laughs> circling the circling the airport okay neither circling the airport and checking out churches what do you want to do you want to look for if you're looking at leaders you want to look at those um, whose character you can test if you're looking online for people you can listen to for a bit more you want to do the same and this is difficult to do online so perhaps in both real life and on the internet look at these people at how they deal with critique how they speak about those who differ from them, as how they speak about those who question them. Look at their character. In fact, I think that's part of the introspection that all of us need to do when it comes to our hearts. So there are two sources of wisdom, that says James. What makes us double-minded is we often listen to both. And we want to consider very seriously which one we listen to the most. How do we know? Well, it's in our conduct. So let's quickly have a look at those two wisdoms. Uh, we'll look at their source, look at their fruit, and then consider where godly wisdom, or what godly wisdom brings about. So there is a wisdom from below. In verse 15, James says it is earthly, unspiritual, and demonic. And he's made quite a bit of mention about the devil and demons in the last few chapters. And I think us mostly white South Africans need to hear that because we do not give as much thought to the spiritual realm or the demonic realm as our brothers and sisters do. We think that the devil's work is limited to spooky stuff, the kind of things that kids dress up at, at Halloween, you know, wicked stuff. The devil hasn't, doesn't have to do that. He just needs to feed us the same story he's been feeding humanity since the beginning. God doesn't want what's best for you. God has no clue what's going on. I think you need to take control of your own destiny and sort things out, otherwise they won't happen. He just needs to tell us that same story so we become envious of each other. Because I don't think God's given me the things that He should have, but it sure looks like He's given you what I feel should be mine. We become envious. Or we go, well, if God isn't taking care of me, I need to take care of myself. And we think we can control all of our lives. We t seek to take charge of it. Because what happens then as we, as we become envious of others and we seek to place ourselves on a pedestal or just on like our own safe space, we begin to barney with each other. And we'll see more of that next week. Because if life is about me getting what I want and making sure I do, everyone else is going to get in my way. So do you want to see something really demonic I don't think we, any of us do. But if you're looking to see proof of something demonic, look for a church where people are all fighting for their own way. That disunity and distrust is all his doing, the devil's doing. The wisdom that we want to ask for, and remember this is the wisdom that God says He will give us if we ask. James chapter 1, verse 5, Proverbs 2, verse 6 says, The Lord gives wisdom. The wisdom we want to ask for has this fruit. It's pure. In other words, there is a moral blamelessness about it. It's someone who is above reproach. They think about other people. Uh, where they wrong other people, they're quick to say sorry. In fact, if you look at verse 17... This wisdom is the opposite of self-seeking. You're striving for peace, uh, for unity. You're gentle. Compliant is a weird word, but it, it, 
the meaning there is you're open to reason. You're humble. You're willing to listen to the other person. Um, you know, with all this stuff happening in the world at the moment, I've been trying to watch the news and watch people's discussions on that. And it's been really, I don't know, it's been, it's been heartbreaking because where there's, you know, you watch some news channel, there's meant to be a debate about person on the one side and person on the other side. And these debates are not debates, they're just shouting matches. Have you seen that? So like, I believe this, I believe that, and we're just going to shout. We're not going to listen to anyone. We're going to talk over each other, just keep saying the same thing or asking the same question. Nothing comes about. And, 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 and everyone's just trying to, to one-up the other. The wisdom from above is quick to listen, open to reason. And that then enables us to do what is really good for others, to show mercy and good fruit there in verse 17. I think this is something that has made Itemba Projects such a great NGO in Sweetwaters. Because I, I remember chatting to Sam and to Stu about it a number of times. They never went in there thinking they knew all the answers and that they were the rescuing NGO going to save the people of Sweetwaters. They went in there asking questions. What do you need? What are the biggest problems? Would this help? No, okay, would this help? What, what do you think would work best? Talking to the community, ready to listen. And I think individually and as churches, we can learn from that. And then notice the last two words that he uses for the fruit of godly wisdom. He says it is unwavering and without pretense. It is single-minded. It pursues it pursues the goal of purity, keeping yourself unstained from the world. Do you remember that from a few weeks ago? And of unity and of peace. In John uh, chapter 17, Jesus prayed a really powerful, personal, direct prayer to the Father. And he pointed out to how he had single-mindedly done all that was necessary to give eternal life to those God had chosen. And he said, this is eternal life, that they may know you, the one true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. And then he keeps on praying, and he says that this mission was to bring unity between God and people, and unity between God's people. So, so he did all of that in order to set people apart for God, which is holiness or purity, and then uniting those people to God and to one another. So wisdom from above, which is pure, peace-loving, gentle, compliant, full of mercy and good fruit, is the kind of life that emulates this about Jesus. So a church that is wise is full of people who are, because they've been set apart by Jesus for God, they're looking to work out their unity. They're looking to bring peace with one another. So where you differ, you look to understand. You are humble, you're open to reason. Whether it's on a personal level, if you've wronged someone or they've wronged you, you kind of sit down and you go, help me understand, let's think about this. Um, when you differ on things that you believe, uh, on, um, you fall back on your unity with Christ and you listen to one another. And you avoid the kind of speech and you avoid the kind of feeling in your heart that would say, well, I need to make my point because I don't trust that God has, has my back here and I have to kind of stand for myself. I need to make my point. In Acts 2, on the day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of Christ was poured out on the first disciples. And when that happened, you know, tongues of flame were over their heads and their tongues spoke different languages, praising God, sharing the news of Jesus in all these different languages of the people in the city. You and I, we want our tongues to be set on fire. Not by hell, but by heaven. You want to ask for wisdom from above so that when you speak, what you're doing is you're sowing peace and unity and bringing about righteousness in your heart, in the life of this church family, and in the community around us. I mean, I, I think most of us are listening to discussions like I described just now. Sometimes they happen in our homes. Sometimes they happen at work. Uh, often they're just on the news or on our favorite YouTube channel. 
just people shouting over each other, people not listening, people being rude at home so that their teacher turns around and changes their mind about them. And that is creating this environment of constant friction and anxiety. Maybe today our prayer can be that God will make Christchurch cascades, whether it's us individually at home or when we're together, that He will make us a community that speak to one another, that speak about one another, that speak to others in such a way that it brings about a harvest of righteousness, that it grows us to be more single-minded followers of Christ, and that God uses that to grow His kingdom. As people around us see here is a community that does not speak to each other the way everyone else does. Here is a community that use their words to build up, to bring peace, and to give life. Let me pray for us right now. No one can control their tongue. But we can ask you, Lord, for wisdom. We can be sure that you will give it, that we may grow in maturity so that we may be able to be better at controlling our tongue. That we could take that bit and become better at steering the body. We can learn how to use the rudder to steer the ship. That we could say things to one another and to others that build up, that bring peace, that share purity and holiness, that point to the love that we have freely in Christ, who said beautiful things. Come to me, all you are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Or a bruised reed he will not break, or it is finished. We pray that his spirit would give us his words that we may bring life to those around us as he has given to us in jesus name amen